Hi everyone, Peter here from Flow High Performance, and in this video we will cover how trainees can use the reps in reserve or rate of perceived exertion concepts to maximize muscle hypertrophy. First, let's explain what exactly these concepts are. Essentially, RIR is an acronym for reps in reserve, and RPE is an acronym for rate of perceived exertion. These concepts both use numerical scales to quantify proximity to failure, or in other words, how close a set was taken before failure. Both of these scales are essentially the same concept, although they use opposite values. Therefore, both concepts are essentially interchangeable in the context of resistance training, and trainees can use whichever one they prefer. The scales essentially work like this. Zero reps in reserve, or RPE 10, means that the lifter could not perform any more repetitions in that set. This is slightly different from training to true failure, but it is essentially stopping the set just before the trainee thinks they are about to hit failure. One rep in reserve, or RPE 9, means that the lifter thinks they could have performed one more quality rep in that set. Two reps in reserve, or RPE 8, means the lifter could have performed two more reps in that set, and so on. It should also be understood that for hypertrophy training, proximity to failure should be defined within specific constraints. There are two primary constraints to consider when assessing proximity to failure. Let's now cover what these are. First is lifting technique. To maximize muscle growth, trainees should lift with a technique which maximizes tension on the target muscle. This will ensure the target muscle is the limiting factor for each set, rather than any other system. So when a set is taken close to failure, trainees should ensure that technique doesn't deviate from the strict standardized form that was used from the first repetition of the set. If trainees get sloppy with their technique towards the end of the set, then it can skew the subjective proximity to failure rating and provide false information about progression over time. Therefore, trainees should ensure technique is strict and effective from the first to last repetition of each set. Proximity to failure is also independent to each set of an exercise. As a lifter performs multiple sets of an exercise and multiple exercises in a single workout, fatigue starts to accumulate and inhibit performance. Furthermore, interset rest periods will determine how much time trainees have between sets to dissipate fatigue. This will further influence lifting performance of each subsequent set. Therefore, trainees should always assess proximity to failure independently for each set, not collectively for the entire workout. Let's now cover what influence proximity to failure has on muscle hypertrophy. We won't go into too much detail on this topic, as this has been extensively covered in other videos on this channel. Essentially, how close a lifter trains to failure is dependent on many different variables. Proximity to failure will differ based on the exercise performed, rep ranges and load used, and the entire context of the training program. Here is a general summary of how close trainees should train to failure based on the nature of the exercise and the load used. Heavy compound lifts with high stability demands should generally be trained slightly further from failure. This is because they are highly fatiguing and are generally trained with heavier loads. This includes exercises like back squats and stiff leg deadlifts. An appropriate proximity to failure for these exercises would be around two to four reps in reserve or a six to eight RPE. Compound lifts which aren't as centrally fatiguing and don't have high stability demands can generally be taken slightly closer to failure. This is because they are overall less fatiguing and the muscle is more likely to limit performance before any other systems. This includes exercises like the seated cable row and the dumbbell shoulder press. An appropriate proximity to failure for these exercises would be around one to three reps in reserve or a seven to nine RPE. And lastly, isolation lifts are generally more suitable to train closer to failure. This is because they induce very little central fatigue, so the target muscle is really the only tissue being stressed. This means regardless of how close to failure we train, the target muscle will always be the limiting factor for each set, assuming technique is strict. This includes exercises like bicep curls and calf raise variations. An appropriate proximity to failure for these exercises would be around zero to two reps in reserve or an eight to 10 RPE. Furthermore, the rep ranges and loads implemented will influence proximity to failure too. When training in the five to 10 rep range, Hypertrophy can be maximized training slightly further from failure since all motor units are recruited with heavier loads earlier in the set. With such loads, it may be appropriate to train around two to four reps in reserve or a six to eight RPE. 
When training in the 10 to 15 rep range, it is necessary to train slightly closer to failure as all muscle fibers won't be significantly involved from the beginning of the set. Therefore, around one to three reps in reserve or a seven to nine RPE is appropriate. And when training in the 15 plus rep range, it is more important to train closer to failure to ensure all motor units are recruited and all muscle fibers are trained. An appropriate proximity to failure for this rep range would be around zero to two reps in reserve or an eight to 10 RPE. So why should we use RAR or RPE in a training program to quantify proximity to failure? Well, the reality is that you don't have to. Trainees can still achieve great results without even considering these scales. However, these scales allow trainees to quantify how close sets are taken to failure, which may provide a more structured prescription of this variable. Furthermore, there are two primary benefits of implementing auto-regulatory systems into your training. Let's now cover what these are. The first is to manage rep ranges and loads. As we should understand from the scientific literature, hypertrophy can be equally achieved across a spectrum of different rep ranges and loads. As long as sets are taken fairly close to failure, trainees can achieve equal hypertrophy per set within the approximate six to 20 rep range. So instead of prescribing exact reps and loads for each session, trainees can simply train to an appropriate proximity to failure. Trainees can then adjust the load they use based on rep performance they achieve with each set. The other primary benefit of using an auto-regulation system is for progressive overload purposes. It is impossible to predict the rate of progression for each trainee. Each lifter's rate of progression will be different based on their training experience, age, external stress, nutrition, genetics, and much more. Some trainees will progress faster, while others will progress slower. So prescribing strict rep ranges and loads each week may not match up with the individual rate that a lifter can progress. Furthermore, lifting performance is likely to vary from session to session based on sleep, motivation, lifting environment, time of day, external stress, and more. So rather than prescribing strict progressive overload, auto-regulation allows lifters to observe trends in performance over time. This will tell us how performance is naturally changing over time and allow lifters to progress at their own individual rate. Now that we have covered the fundamentals of proximity to failure, let's now explore how we can use the RAR or RPE scales to program hypertrophy training. Essentially, trainees can prescribe an approximate proximity to failure range for each exercise. This can then be used to determine loads used and to observe performance over time. Let's explore how this may look practically in a training program. As we can see here, we have an example four week mesocycle following an upper lower training split. The exact program is not important for this video. We are just using this as an example to demonstrate how to implement RAR or RPE into this program. So for this example, we have three sets of all exercises in weeks two to four and two sets in week one. This is because week one is a deload week while the following three weeks are overloading training with higher volumes. For this program, we will use the reps in reserve system to prescribe proximity to failure, although RPE could be used in the exact same way. As we can see, each exercise has a specific RAR range. This is not a strict RAR number, rather it is a rough range. This is because it doesn't matter the exact proximity to failure that a trainee achieves, as long as it is roughly in the range prescribed. Furthermore, these systems are inherently subjective in nature, which means there will be some variation in how accurately it is assessed. Let's now take a more detailed look at how and why these specific RAR ranges were implemented. Let's have a look in more detail at day one, an upper body session. As we can see here, the compound lifts, which are the bench press, barbell row, and lat pull down, have been prescribed with an RIR of one to two. This is because they are slightly more fatiguing and will likely be trained in slightly lower rep ranges. The isolation lifts, which are the cable fly, dumbbell curl, and tricep extensions, have been prescribed at an RIR of zero to one. This is because they are less fatiguing and will likely be trained in higher rep ranges. Now that the RIR for each exercise has been prescribed, trainees can then go through the mesocycle and observe how performance trends over time. It is more important to observe trends over a long-term time frame rather than from week to week. So one mesocycle probably won't be enough time to see any true performance improvements. Rather, trainees may need multiple mesocycles in a row to see true performance improvements. For example, let's take the bench press from day one of our example mesocycle. 
Let's say in week one, this trainee lifts 70 kilos for eight and seven reps respectively. Since trainees will be more fatigued with each set, a performance drop is expected from set to set. In week two, the same trainee may perform eight, then seven, then six reps respectively with the same 70 kilos. In week three, they may perform nine, then seven, then six reps. And in week four, they perform nine, eight, six reps. So as we can see, there is a slight increase in rep performance from week to week, but nothing substantial. The next mesocycle may look something like this. Now we can start to see a more obvious gradual trend in performance over time. There are some fluctuations here and there, but for the most part, it is trending in a positive direction. So as we can see, no training variables have been changed in the program, although the trainee is still making progress. This same program can be given to multiple different lifters, and they can all make progress at their own individual rate. This also accounts for fluctuations in lifting performance from session to session, which can't be achieved with strict rep and load prescription. Thanks for watching and hopefully you got something out of this video. Remember to subscribe if you haven't already.